Good morning, everybody. Peter Carson here with Envision IT and IT Unity for our Running Effective Projects in Office 365 webinar. Quick introductions on my side. I'm the president of Envision IT and Extranet User Manager. I'm also a SharePoint MVP and a partner seller with Microsoft Canada. My credentials are up on the screen here, my blog site and uh, websites. We're going to be posting these decks both to the IT Unity website as well as the Envision IT and Extranet user manager sites, so you get all my details from there afterwards if you need to reach out to me. I'll do a little introduction on who Envision IT and Extranet User Manager are. We're Office 65 productivity consultants. In the past, we've focused on SharePoint but with the transition to cloud, really uh, focusing not only on SharePoint but the whole 365 stack, which is what today's session is going to be about. Um, in particular, in the SharePoint space, we focus on websites, intranets, extranets, and collaboration portals, which we've been doing for more than 14 years now. We also have a product we're going to be talking about it in uh, the context of project sites near the end of the webinar called the Extranet User Manager. It's all about um, really simplifying the delegation of user management down to the business. How do you bring people in from outside your organization, whether that's to your on-premises SharePoint or into Office 365, dealing with things like self-registration, approvals, forgotten password reset, and such from there. So I don't want to make this a sales presentation. This is really about uh, running projects in Office 365. So let's jump right into the meat of it. And we'll go over a quick agenda here in terms of what we're going to cover in the next hour. So to start, we've already done the introductions. We'll go into some background on project management. Then we'll talk more about project sites in Office 365, which is really the meat of what we're going to be going through here. We're going to look at a number of different ways of doing that. And then we'll talk about governance and permissions, site provisioning, the things that you need to think about as you're working with those project sites in Office 365. We'll also touch on external users. You know, typically projects don't entail only internal staff. They often entail external parties as well. How do you bring those people in and make them part of your project sites? And then we'll wrap it up from there. I have one of my colleagues, uh, Mark Campbell, who's a senior consultant at Envision IT, on the call as well. He's going to be watching the Q&A as we go through here. So if you've got questions, if you want to clarify, you want me to slow down, go deeper into something, well, let me post those questions out. He's going to moderate those and raise those to my attention. So at different points through the session, we can take a quick break and answer those rather than holding those all to the end. Mark will also be answering ones through the, uh, the Q&A panel itself as well. Okay, let's start with a little background from a, a project management point of view. You know, what are some of the things that people talk about when they think about managing projects? You, know, you always hear things like on time and on budget is, is how we need our projects to run. What sort of return on investment are we going to see? How does it align with our strategic goals and objectives as an organization? You know, what sort of quality, business value are we seeing coming out of that? We think about some of the uh, you know things that we personify around a, a highly successful project management. So what are the things to to look at? I went out and just pulled some of this off of the internet and said, okay, we'll look at agility, micromanagement. But one of the things that we see through a lot of these themes is really around communications. That uh, planning, urgency, visualize, communicate, um, open communications. That's a huge part of successful project management. Any project manager who's worth their salt is a great communicator because they really have to shepherd the cats both from the uh, stakeholder point of view, from the project team member's point of view, from senior management's perspective, make sure everybody understands what they're supposed to be doing and how it's all hanging together. And as they're doing that, they're really looking at you know, the, the standard project management triangle that you'll see in any sort of uh, PMP course or things like that in terms of what can you manage on a project. If you look at the variables of time, scope, and cost, you know, the idea is those are all interrelated to each other, but you can't really optimize all three of those. You can't say, I need this done on this date with these features for these dollars. That can be your desired goal, uh, but really you have to prioritize and say, okay, you know, the data is immovable. We've got to play and, and manage the scope, and the cost is the cost that comes out of that or, or however the most important is through those three within that. But across that trifactor of, of elements of project management is quality as well and, and how does that get impacted by your decisions around pressing the schedule or trying to keep costs down or, or trying to broaden the scope as you're going through the project. So those are important things and it really doesn't matter 
what methodology you're using to run your project. I mean, as an IT organization, we're often involved in both waterfall and agile projects. And this applies not just to technology projects, to projects as a whole. You know, waterfall where you do a, a, a very top-down, we're going to start with requirements, go through deep discovery, uh, do our design work from there, and only when we're completed all of that for the entire project will we start working on implementation and then verification and maintenance from there. Versus agile where we say, you know what, let's get a, a minimum viable product out the door, let's work more agile through sprints and add feature sets as we go through there and rather than trying to figure out everything at the beginning, um, kind of layer that on through the life of the project. We're actually more of a fan of the agile process. We find that um, saying we're going to do all the requirements gathering up front is, is somewhat setting yourself up for failure. You, you don't know what you don't know and you're going to learn as a, a team as you're working through the project. So make sure that you've got a process that adapts to that. What we often end up doing is a hybrid approach of that to say, well, we're going to do some waterfall up front. You know, maybe it's a public-facing website. We need to to think about user experience and creative design and maybe some focus groups and things like that. But then as we get into the functionality of the site, let's move to an agile mode. Say, so, okay, as we're building functional areas, let's work with the business owners, the product owners, and uh, and work through that process. If we come back to our earlier theme around communications, you know, I love this cartoon. It's been around for a long time. We use it actually as a kickoff for our what is agile presentations that we do to new clients to, to kind of bring them up to speed as to why agile is important and why communication is so important in projects. If you think about, you know, on the top left, how a customer explains what they're looking for and then all the iterations as, as different folks touch it uh, down to what ultimately gets delivered and supported. And, and in fact, what the customer originally explained wasn't even really what they needed. They didn't, you know, not through their fault, through the process, they, they gain an understanding of what their requirements really are. And uh, in an agile process and effective communications really try to avoid those sorts of situations where, where what you end up delivering as part of your project is not at all what the business is looking for and there's a real lack of business value coming out from that point of view. So we want to avoid that and make sure that effective communications are part of the projects. So let's think about uh, typical communication methods. You know, if we start on the left with traditional communications, you know, we've got in-person face-to-face meetings or phone calls, uh, emails, documents, Word, Excel, PowerPoint that get traded back and forth is how projects typically run. As, as we've seen in the more recent years, you know, virtual meetings like we're doing here today with the GoToWebinar are a great way to get a team together without requiring them to be physically together. Instant messaging we're actually using as we're lighting up the uh, the webinar here and just communicating back and forth quickly as a team. It's a much better way for immediate responses than email. It's, it's more like a phone call without having that interruption side to it. Enterprise social, also a great alternative to email to say, okay, well, how do we capture sort of the collective knowledge of this project? If we put it all into emails back and forth within the project team, as that project team changes over time, new members get added, added members get dropped, they don't have visibility to that history through there. You know, somebody that joins the project halfway through if all of the history is in people's inboxes, they're unaware of that. You use something like Yammer from an enterprise social point of view, actually capture that knowledge and make it available to everybody, not just within the team from the beginning. Drop-ins, people that need oversight, all have that visibility. And obviously portals is what we're going to be focusing on here today with Office 365 to say, okay, well, how do we build a shared space that can maybe tie together a lot of these different communication methods and be that one place that you come to from a project management point of view. And what we're proposing here is, is using Office 365 for that. So what I'd like to start with is a couple of polls first. I want to get a sense from an audience point of view, who's using what different versions of SharePoint. Um, so Lyman, if you can open up the polls for us here, and people can just respond back as to whether they're currently in Office 365, they're running SharePoint Server 2013 or 2010, foundations, older versions, not sure. Uh, let's just get some feedback and response back from that point of view. So we're going to give you uh, about a minute or so to respond back to that, and then we're going to share some of those results back. So bear with me a minute. So we'll keep that open for about another 20 seconds or so. About 70% uh, of you responded so far, so that's great.
Okay, so let's close those down. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to share those back so everybody can see as an audience what does that look like. So pretty evenly split, actually, between Office 365 and SharePoint Server 2013, one-third, one-third. Uh, still a bunch of folks back on SharePoint Server 2010 probably wondering, you know, do I upgrade to 2013, do I go to 2016, and uh, then that's very close on the horizon, or do I move into Office 365? Hopefully some of the information we provide today helps with that decision in terms of some of the cool things that we're building in Office 365. Still a few folks on SharePoint Foundation as well. Um, you won't be able to leverage what, uh, what we're talking about here nearly the the same degree, um, but from somebody on SharePoint Server 2013 or even 2010, a lot of the concepts that we're talking about here, you could actually leverage in that environment as well. You know, so even though this is a 365 focused session, uh, don't consider this as only working in 365. You can take the concepts and apply them to on-premise as well. Okay, so now I'm going to just open up a, a second poll here. So Lyman, if you can share that out. And ignoring what version of SharePoint you're on, I just want to get a sense of how you're using SharePoint today. You know, is it more for internal collaboration? Think about team sites. I mean, that's how a lot of people first start their exposure with SharePoint. Or do you have your corporate intranet um, employee portal up on SharePoint from an intranet point of view? Anybody running extranets? Do you have external folks coming in and collaborating with you or consuming content that you've got on your SharePoint site? Or perhaps you're running your public-facing your site, your www site, uh, through that. So again, we'll keep that open for a bit. Uh, you can respond to more than one of these. So if there's multiple workloads that you're currently using, just check them all off. All right, so let me just close that one down. And we'll share that out. Um, so not surprisingly, most of the folks using it from an internal collaboration point of view. Actually, we usually see a little higher numbers from an internet and, uh, and often from an extranet point of view. But internal collaboration is actually the sweet spot that we're going for here today. Because really, the, the session is all about projects, but really, how do you collaborate on those projects? So good to see from that point of view. So let me just hide that and come back to my slides. Now, I promise I won't PowerPoint you to, to death. We are going to go into to live demo sides, but I want to start with a little background first. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Office 365 per se, uh, people often think about it just in the, the key workloads, which are email or exchange, um, instant messaging or Skype for business, and SharePoint. It's actually a fair bit broader than that, and particularly around the SharePoint side of things. It spawned a lot of different elements to that if we think about the... Um, the OneDrive side as part of SharePoint effectively. I mean, that's your personal shared space for file sharing. And a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about, like Office 65 groups, actually leverage the OneDrive side of it rather than the SharePoint side. Uh, there is a projects elements if you're running a full project management office and maybe you're running a project server. You know, that's certainly something you can do. We're not going to delve into that here today. We're really focused more on uh, project management light. How do you do project management for the masses without getting into a whole PMO project server type of life cycle? Uh, there's, there's obviously Power BI in there as well from an analytics point of view. You know, as you start to capture data on your projects, lighting that up in Power BI would be a very interesting thing. Delve from a knowledge discovery point of view. If you're not familiar with that, have a look. It's an interesting concept. So basically what Microsoft is doing is if you've got all your content up in Office 365, whether that's your mail, your calendar, your documents in SharePoint, they use machine intelligence to start to build a social graph of how you work with other people in your organization, what kinds of things are relevant uh, to you or to others that you're looking at through there. So it really surfaces up documents and people and such through that interface. It can be a little creepy if you think about it too much because it, it is reading your email, it's looking at the documents you're collaborating on, establishing those connections. I mean, it's not sharing that back with Microsoft. It's, it's all private within your tenant, but it's using that machine intelligence to, then to, to build those connections and surface that information. Video from a video sharing portal. I mean, video is becoming a much more important communications method. All the online versions of the Office products. OneNote actually is something I'm a huge fan of. We're going to talk more about that as well. So that's that's a key part of how we see collaborating as a project team together. A nice thing to see with the, the 365 stack is Microsoft has become much more open from a cross-platform point of view as well. You know, it's it's 
browser agnostic, whether you're using Chrome, Firefox, Safari versus Internet Explorer, that's fine. You don't need to be on a Windows device, Mac, iOS, Android, all work very well. They've done an awesome job of rolling out different apps, both for the Android and the iOS side. In fact, we're seeing apps coming out first and richer faster on the iOS platform and Android platform than the Windows phone platform. So you know, Microsoft's really putting a priority on those major platforms out there. But all three of those uh, phone devices broadly supported from that point of view. There is a past seminar I did back in the spring just around a broad overview of 365. So if you want more detail from that point of view, uh, just click back to that link once you get the deck. So let's start at the beginning. You know, 78% of you said we do internal collaboration. Uh, team sites is typically where that happens. You know, that really goes back to the roots of SharePoint. We actually first started working with SharePoint in 2001. We weren't a SharePoint partner. I don't know if anybody was at that point in time. Uh, we were a .NET development shop. We were running big projects and we needed a place to manage them. We had document management requirements and such. And we fired up um, SharePoint mainly because we were a Microsoft partner and we had access to the bits. Uh, started using it, realizing it was very powerful from a document management point of view. You know, the current team site template, it's got a document library, a news feed, a OneNote notebook, and a wiki library as part of that. There is a project um, template as well that adds a few things to that. Uh, you can extend it yourself into your own uh, custom lists and libraries as part of that as well. But it's very SharePoint centric. You know, it's, it's really about um, documents in document libraries and items in lists, whether those are events from a calendar point of view, task items from a task point of view, all living within SharePoint. So that gets you so far, but you know a lot of people don't want to work exclusively in SharePoint. If you think about uh, communications and scheduling, yes, I can have a calendar in SharePoint, but what most people would like is having a calendar in Exchange that they can just use as part of their regular calendar. So we'll talk about how we, we get to that in a second. So if we think about other options though, uh, we actually use document sets a fair bit from a, a project management point of view. If we've got very simple light projects, actually if I flip over into our um, intranet site that we have hosted in Office 65 for our extranet user manager line of business, uh, we can see here we've got a, an events library that has upcoming events in there. We've got one there for this actual webinar that we're running here. So we can see a start date on that. I can click into that. And what we've done is created a document set for that. So way to think about document sets is they're really folders with metadata. So we can define, you know, start and end dates, a type of event, is there a web page, a go to webinar link, we actually didn't fill out all the details on this particular one, and then a place to drop the documents related to that. So this is the actual presentation that we're running through here today. So if I need to go back and find the deck from that June webinar that I referred to, you know, I'll find it in this event library. I can actually see that as an events calendar in SharePoint. Even though these aren't actual calendar items, these are actually libraries that contain all the information about that. So I can go back into September and say, okay, here's the different webinars that we ran. Give me all the details on that. Let me dive into it from there. So we can actually see in this one here, if I pull it up, you know, we've got the dates on it and such. The, the links to the, the webinar, we've actually got the, the decks and all the information related to that as well. So that's a nice way to do quick and simple if it's, uh, it's easy from that point of view. But let's take it up a level. You know, we, we talked about team sites where everything's in, um, in SharePoint. We talked about document sets as a quick and dirty way to do that. Office 365 Groups is really the next evolution from that, from our point of view. This is a new feature that came out in the spring from the 365 Group. And to come back from the earlier uh, poll results we had in terms of who was on-premise versus who's in the cloud, you know, this is one of the reasons, uh, I would say, pros and cons of being in the cloud, is that things come out very quickly. We're seeing rapid development of new features in Office 365 through that. And it takes much longer for those to make them into their, their on-premise products. Will we see Office 365 groups in SharePoint 2016? Haven't heard about it yet. You know, Maybe there'll be some hybrid version of that as part of that. We're still getting early bits out in terms of what's, uh, what's gonna be coming in from a feature set point of view there. So if you want to have the, the latest features, you really want to be in the cloud, and that's why we're focusing on Office 365 for this talk here. So the idea of the 365 group is to combine both Exchange and SharePoint, to say, well, email and calendar, people like doing that in Exchange. You know, they, they want to see stuff in their inbox through Outlook, they want to schedule things through their calendar. I don't know about you, I, I 
got multiple inboxes from an email point of view that I manage for different lines of business that I'm involved in, that's a challenge in itself. I could not live with multiple calendars. Anybody wants to invite me to a meeting, I insist that they use one um, calendar, which is my exchange calendar for that. So I can see the pushback from people to say, well, we don't want to track calendar items in a SharePoint calendar because we want them in our Outlook calendar. And sure, you can share your SharePoint calendar into Outlook so it, it looks like an Outlook calendar, you can overlay it on your, your regular calendar, but really, people want them right in their calendar itself. But I don't want to use my Exchange and Inbox as a document management system. Too many people do that. They email documents back and forth in the project group as attachments, you know, and that quickly gets out of hand. You've got 10 members to your project team, somebody sends half a dozen documents to the team, people start editing random ones, sending them back from there, very quickly lose control of that, and, and who has what version. People are working on different versions of the same file that you then need to reconcile together. Single version of the truth in SharePoint is a mantra that I've loved to hear and, and I say all the time to our clients is put that document into SharePoint. In fact, as new employees join Envision IT, they often email me file attachments. First thing I do is send it back to them, say, figure out where to put this in our SharePoint uh, structure, send me the link to it. In fact, if you're running Outlook 2016, uh, Microsoft's really embracing this. So if I come over to my inbox for a second here, Let me actually just fire up a, a new email for a second. So I'll pull this over onto the screen. Now when I want to attach a file, two very nice things. So the first is it actually shows me the recent items. I was just working on that presentation. Bad me, I was working on it on the downloads folder. Um, I subsequently loaded it up into SharePoint, so we've got it up in there. But let's say we want to actually pull up something out of our SharePoint site here. I go to attach it, and you can see here it says recipients can edit. What it's doing is it's sending a smart attachment, so it's actually sending a link to the SharePoint site in this email. So if I send this out to the, the 10 people in the project management group, they receive it. You know, somebody looks at that email a month later, they're not looking at that month-old version of that budget, they're linking into the SharePoint site and getting the up-to-date version. In fact, three people click on that link, want to edit it together. You know, in Excel, as long as you do that in the browser, you can actually co-author that document. Likewise with Word, with PowerPoint. It just makes that collaboration so much richer from that point of view to do that. So, so that's really the key is, is let's keep the email and calendar in Exchange. Let's keep the documents in SharePoint. Now, what happens in a 365 group? Let's actually flip over into the browser and actually take you through a bit of a walkthrough of that. So I'm going to be flipping with a bunch of different identities. So I'm logged into our uh, Office 65 Groups demo site right now. And you can see here, Inbox is actually where you start your work with 365 Groups. So I can see here some groups that I've created. But let's go through and actually create a new group. So I'll say Create Group. We'll call it an IT Unity Webinar. It has an ID associated with it that I can update if I want to. And I can actually invite people in through here. I can define whether they actually um, start getting notified through their email automatically or whether they have to subscribe to receive that. So let's go ahead and create that group. So I'm going to leave that side out just for now. I'll say not now. So it's now preparing that group. So what it's building, it's actually building a mailbox in Exchange that has an inbox for email and a calendar for shared calendaring. And it's creating a site collection in OneDrive for us to put files and share and collaborate as a group. So we can see we've got sort of those three elements. We can start a conversation, we can view group files, we can use the calendar. Now start a conversation, I'm working through the browser right now, is really an email conversation. So I can say, okay, well, I can point it to the group itself, and I can also connect it, say, to my full regular Envision IT email. So I'm not even a member of the group right now. We'll just call this a test email, and we'll go ahead and send that out. Actually, sorry, there's one other I want to add it to, which is me as the identity logged in on this here. So if I come back to my inbox for a second here, So we can see a new email just came through. 
as a test email, and it's going to the group, to my Envision IT account, and to this identity that I'm currently logged in as right now. So the way to think about this is there's always going to be email communications that happens as a project. What you do is you create an Office 55 group for the project, actually CC the project itself on all those communications. The beauty of that is that somebody can come in late to the game, you know, not on day one. They can come to that Office 55 group site. They can actually see the conversations here, which are effectively those emails. So they get that whole history of everything that's in there. You can use the awesome search features in Office 55 to search through those conversations and get all that history as part of that. So basically, once you've created that project site, you just keep CCing the project to that. Now let's think about that from a, uh, a calendaring point of view. So I can actually use the calendar here to say, well, I want to create a project meeting. You know, we're going to get together tomorrow at uh, 11 a.m. So I can click in Thursday at 11 a.m. and say this is a project meeting and go ahead and save that. Now actually what I should do though is actually add some people to that. Actually, I'm logged in as that person, so bear with me a second here. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of identities I'm bouncing around in here. So we'll go ahead and save that. So if I come back to my Outlook here, come over to my calendar, let's ignore my other crazy calendars for a moment. Just close a few of those out. So here's the the identity that I'm logged in right now, and I can see there's my project meeting. So just like we CC'd the project from an email tracking point of view, you can do the same thing here, and you actually invite the uh, the project to your meetings through there. Actually, it didn't show up on there, but yeah, so the idea is that you then see that in the, the project calendar through here. So it becomes a very powerful feature. You, you CC the project on your emails, you invite it to all the meetings, all that history then gets captured in the project site. So I love that part of it. Let's come back to uh, the main group here again. And let's say I wanna have a look at the files associated with that. Sorry, there we go. I think I've got too many calendars open. There we are. Sorry, I'm gonna flip back to mail. That's a better view for me. Come into the ITD Unity. And what I wanted to do was get over to the file side here. So it's actually setting up a site collection now because I'm the first person that's gone in to, to share that as a place to keep my group files. And as I mentioned before, this is actually a OneDrive site collection where we can drop the files in. And anybody who's a member of this group then has vis visibility into those files. You can permission that, so if you want to keep private areas as part of that, you can set up folder structures and such as part of that. The important thing to remember, though, is this is not a full SharePoint site. So we don't have content types and metadata and you know document retention and records management and all the features that are part of SharePoint from a document management point of view, which honestly is how we, how we first started working with SharePoint. I mean, if we go back 15 years, that's what drew us to SharePoint was its document management features. So a little disappointed that we don't have that rich feature set within here. And you know, we'd like to see groups coupled with a full SharePoint site so we get all of that functionality. So let me come back to uh, my, my PowerPoint here. So we talked about conversations being email threads, calendars or exchange calendars, uh, documents. They do have a version history, so you do see uh, past history as people are editing those documents. That's really the only SharePoint feature that you get as part of the, the documents in Office 55 groups. So there's no metadata, there's no approvals, records, there's no additional SharePoint lists that you can build out as part of that. So that's kind of where 365 groups are. Great concept, it, like we, we said, you know, this idea of minimum viable products from a, an agile point of view, Microsoft is embracing that themselves and saying, okay, let's get this out the door, let's figure out how people are using this and then figure out how we want to adjust and adapt and add to that. One of the things that they're looking to add to that is called Office 365 Planner. Now this one's not actually out yet, so I can't do a live demo. These screenshots are from the, the blog posts from Microsoft announcing this uh, about a month or so ago. They're expecting it, um, they said last quarter of 2015, realistically that probably means sometime next month in November we should see those coming out. 
Now that's not going to be for everybody. One of the, the interesting things about Office 365 is you have a choice to decide um, how early or how late you want to get new product feature sets. So if you if you want to be on the, the first wave, you actually sign up for that in your tenant, you'll get new features like this as soon as they come out. And then you can be on later waves or circles to say, well, I don't want to get the new features right away. Push me a little further back into that queue so that you can have other people work out the bugs and figure out how to use the stuff before you as an organization start using that. But 365 Planner, what it is, it's really an extension of 365 Groups. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between groups and plans. And for the context of what we're talking about here today, think of a plan as a project. So you create a, a project site in SharePoint to manage your projects. Here you create a plan, which effectively is the same sort of idea. Under the hood, it creates an Office 365 group as part of that. Or if you choose to create a group, it creates a plan. You know, either way, you can go through the interface, much like many things in Microsoft. They give you lots of different ways to do the same thing, achieve the same result through there. But the idea here is that tasks are represented as cards. And you can see that on the top screenshot there. We've got different cards showing different tasks. They can be assigned to people. They can have due dates associated with them. And we can actually put attachments and conversations into those tasks themselves as well. So we've got a task to finish the business case for the project. You can actually attach the business case document to that card and to that task. It'll actually show a, a preview of that document right within the card. You know, it, it visualizes that very nicely from that point of view. And then you can organize your cards into what are called boards. So if you've got different phases, maybe you've got a six-phase project, we're back in the requirements gathering phase and there's a whole bunch of cards or tasks associated with that with their documents, you can organize all those into a requirements gathering board. And then there's another level above that to say, well, you, we've actually got a hub view that tracks progress across plans. So if you think about, well, how do we um, you know, sort of have visibility organizationally to all these different projects, that's what the hub view is about. Uh, the challenge here, though, is that as you're attaching documents to those cards, they have the same limitations as in groups, which is they're, they're being stored in OneDrive. We've got the version history on there, but again, we don't have that richer metadata around that. So I'm just going to take a quick pause here, look at the questions that we've been having, and have a sip of water. Bear with me just a sec. Uh, so Mark, you had a question from Steve Palmo about uh, what do you mean setting up ODFB site collection, OneDrive for business site collection. Yeah, so under the hood, both planner and groups are using the OneDrive infrastructure in order to provision the spot to, to save your files. If I come back into here, so this files view that I'm seeing here, if you look at the URL on that, you see I'm in the slash sites slash IT Unity webinar. So it's used the, the ID of the group that I've created as the URL in to create a new site collection to store these documents. You might say, well, can I just navigate to the underscore settings on that and start using it like a regular SharePoint site? And the answer is no, because unfortunately that's not a full SharePoint site under the hood. It's a OneDrive template, which is just a file repository that only has version history as a feature on that. Uh, Mark, other questions that uh, you think we want to tackle as a group here or keep rolling into things from there? Okay, we're going to keep rolling. So let me come back to my deck. So let's put a wish list out there and say, okay, if we had our sort of full environment that we wanted from a project management point of view, what would that look like? What's well, given that we want to use Exchange for email and calendar? We saw how important that is, how people live in their outlook. They want to integrate it right into their calendar, into their inbox as part of that. So let's have that. I haven't touched on OneNote yet, so, so if we go back to the Office 55 groups, one of the things that the group site template does is it creates a OneNote file um, to allow you to do ad hoc note taking. And, and when we get into the next section of the demo, I'll show you more of that OneNote side of things. But we want full SharePoint document libraries. We want it all. I want content types, I want site columns, I want the ability to set retention policies, mark records, go through workflows, create custom lists for my tasks, my issues, risks, decisions, whatever I choose to put into my project site template, I want that available as part of that. 
I also want to share that with external users, uh, even pull in external systems. You know, can I surface up apps within that? Maybe there's financial systems or time tracking or bug tracking that are not part of Office 365 at all, but I want to make them visible as part of that system. So what does that look like? Let's take you through what we've done just as a, a starting point from a proof of concept perspective. So if I come back into, let me think about this here. My projects demo. Sorry, too many URLs to remember. So this is not a fully baked, ready to roll. It's it's sort of our vision of what could be there. We're working with some clients now to flesh that out and actually make them make that real for them. But the concept here, um, imagine that you've got clients here, a for-profit business, and for each of those clients, you have one or more projects that you run for them. So we want to create both a client site template and a project site template to manage our projects. We want to do that as a full um, SharePoint site template, so I've got all that functionality that we talked about, but I want to leverage the, the 365 group side into that as well. So let's start by going into an existing one that we have here for Acme TNT. So I click into their project site. So I'm still in Office 365. We've created a template, we've provisioned it, and here's our home page of our project. Now, we haven't done any fancy visualization. There's some cool stuff we've talked about in terms of putting some, uh, some dashboards and indicators on here as well. They could really light this site up. But up at the top, you know, we've got a little custom app that we put in here that, that pulls in who's the client for this, what's their client website, what are some details around this project. And those are really driving from um, upper level lists that we have here that are managing the, the list of clients and the relationships to the projects. Let's come back down into that project site. And then we've got a bunch of just out of the box SharePoint web parts that we've added onto here. So I mentioned the idea of having a, a full rich SharePoint document library is a key piece. So that's the top left here, the project documents. We've got our, our documents in here. We can see that we've got content types. So I've got communications, reports, requirements, document types. I've got a document status on them as to whether they're approved or draft or waiting for approval. So I can have workflows around that. I can associate um, templates behind those content types when I want to create a new document. You know, is it a project document or a functional spec or presentation that I'm building? There's actually a template for those documents. So we're not starting with a blank page. We've got a standard format for that. So from a document management point of view, we're much richer than what we have in that OneDrive for business experience we're having in the Office 65 groups. We really like that full uh, document record management features of SharePoint. Let's expose them as part of our SharePoint list. Now we've also created a number of out of the box, or, sorry, uh, custom lists very easily through here. We've created a task list, so we've, we can assign tasks to folks in here. And we see this uh, leveraging the Office 65 planner side where these could become cards later on as part of that. But maybe we don't associate documents to those cards. We keep those documents in the main project documents so we can have a proper governance and control around those documents as part of that repository. But we can also create other lists very easily through there. We can manage our issues from a project's point of view through an issue list here. We've got a very simple one that just has a title and assigned to status priority due date. You can extend that out, make that as rich as you'd like through that. So it's very easy in SharePoint uh, to create those custom lists. And the idea is that you don't create them for each site. You actually make it part of the site template. So every project site that you spin up becomes part of this. We've got risks, decisions, there's other things we want to track as a, a project. And we've got meeting minutes here. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But then we've got calendar and conversation. So we said, okay, we want to leverage the Office 365 group side of it. Uh, let's actually have a 365 group behind this site uh, that manages this. So really, you're going to end up with two things. You're going to have a, a 365 group and a full SharePoint site. Well, how do you blend that so people have one place that they go to to see that information? Well, what we can do is we can actually use the APIs that Microsoft provides to us to actually reach into those Office 65 groups and pull information from that. So if we've got calendar meetings that are in there, we can actually surface that and display that right on the main project site. If I click into that project meeting, I've left the SharePoint site, I've gone into the calendar view of that particular project meeting. I can update it through here if people have um, been invited to that through their Outlook, you know, they'll get that updated invitation as part of that. This one's in the past, so we don't see that functionality, uh, but, but it keeps that rich functionality in exchange. We can do the same thing with conversations. We can actually link over into that test conversation, and again, we're jumping into 
the, um, the email side of Exchange Online, saying, okay, here's the threaded conversation around that particular piece. So we're leveraging the best of both. We're saying, okay, well, let's surface it up through the project site, but as soon as somebody wants to dive into the details of that, let's just dump right into the Office 365 group side of it and navigate them down into that piece. Now, I mentioned early on that when you create a, a 365 group site, it creates a OneNote library or document as part of that. And that's a feature we really like. And you see that in the, uh, the team sites in 2013 as well. And it's something that we've leveraged as part of this here too. So the idea is that you can then use that for ad hoc note taking as a, a project. And what better way to do that than around meeting minutes for agenda items through there? So I can actually click on that project meeting link here And it actually takes me into the OneNote online where we've got all the details from the project. Now, I didn't actually manually populate all this information to start with. So if I come back to my Outlook, and this is something that was there in 2013 as well, if I open up a calendar item, let me just come back to the correct calendar. Bear with me a sec. So here's my project meeting. And you'll see here, there's a link for meeting notes. When I click on that, you see it's got the OneNote icon on there. It's actually going to uh, share the notes with the meeting, and take them on my own. I have a choice here of where I want to place those OneNotes. And what I would want to do is actually place them in the OneNote notebook for the project itself. I'm in the Acme TNT um, site right now. So associate it with that particular OneNote. And what it does is it actually pre-populates it with all these details. It fills in the date, the message, the participants, and then it's ready for me to just start banging my notes in through here. The cool thing, if you haven't used this, is not only can this then sync down to all your devices. So I have OneNote installed on my iPhone 6. I've got it on my Surface laptop that I keep with me, my desktop computers. It all works very well, either online or offline. So I can see these notes when I'm disconnected. It'll sync back up when I get back in. But when we're actually in the meeting, we do this quite often in Vision IT. We'll have multiple people each in the same page in the OneNote. And as they're typing things in here, you know, each person is putting their own notes in. You actually live see it on each other's screen. So rather than then trying to consolidate everybody's meeting notes together into a single set of minutes, it's already happening live as you're working together. So it just really ups things from a collaboration point of view. It becomes very powerful from that perspective. So that's really our vision is to say, okay, well, how do we create a rich uh, SharePoint site template that works well from that point of view, leverage what's there from a 365 groups point of view, from a OneNote point of view, and really knit it all together in one project site. So let's come back to, to the deck here. So we talked about the Exchange, the OneNote, the full SharePoint document library. We've got our custom lists there. We haven't touched on the, the external user side. We're going to hold that for a minute. What I want to cover first is just around uh, a bit of governance around this. So how do we make this work well organizationally? How do we you know, do change management and, and deal with um, communicating out to people how they use these sites and then make sure that they don't get out of control from that point of view? Governance is a word that gets used a lot with SharePoint. Um, really, governance is, our governance plan is a strong part of any 365 project. Really what it comes down to is defining the roles and responsibilities for, for everybody involved in that site. It's not just who's allowed to do what. Uh, permissions are a part of that, but also best practices and what you should do. Training becomes a big part of governance as well. Uh, but permissions is something that I want to focus down in on um, in particular here right now. So if we think about um, how we deal with permissions in SharePoint, so we can apply them at a lot of different levels. We can apply permissions at the top level of the site. We can give permissions just into an individual list or library, even a folder within that, or even an individual document or item within a list or a library. From a, a governance point of view, though, it's really important, um, I feel, to, to really focus just at those top two levels. That at, at a minimum, we're going to allow permissions to be applied at the list or library level, preferably at the site level. We don't want to get into folder level or item level because it just gets out of control as an organization. Now that's part of it. The other part of it is how do we apply those permissions? Because permissions can be applied to both users and groups, and groups can mean a lot of things. That term actually gets kind of confusing when you throw it around in the 365 world. Do you mean a SharePoint group, an Office 365 group, which is not the same thing. They're different from each other. Or do you mean an underlying group like a, an Active Directory group, which actually replicates and becomes a, a shadow group in Azure AD. 
or we're going to talk more about Extranet User Manager, which actually has its own groups as well, which also become Azure AD groups. Again, good governance says only apply permissions to groups. Don't start applying permissions to individuals. You say, well, only these two people need access to this particular library. I'm just going to directly give them access. Guess what? You know, a month from now, it's a third person, and you've applied those permissions in a bunch of places. Now you need to remember, oh, have I reapplied those permissions in all the right spots? You shouldn't be doing that. You should be applying it to a group. The membership of the group changes. If that group has got permissions applied in half a dozen different spots, you don't have to think about where those spots are. You just change the membership of the group. So really, when you come back to governance, you know, thinking about permissions and group membership, who manages permissions should be different than who manages group membership. So if we come back to our site template that we have here, you, you may have a complex permission structure in here. You may have uh, project documents that you want to share with clients and other ones that are internal only. Maybe you've got different libraries for that. You know, parts of the sites you want to share with different audiences. That permission structure can get fairly complex. You really want to bake that in as part of the template so that people aren't applying those permissions on every project site that they do. But the reality is somebody different needs to control who goes in those groups. So the project manager that owns this particular project, maybe they can't change that differentiation between internal and client uh, libraries. That's fixed as part of the template. But they can certainly define who are the internal staff members and who are the clients that should be coming in to see that. So that's really the key thing is to say, well, let's differentiate between that. To control the permissions, you want to tightly control that. You know, that's something that you want to have strong governance around that. But the business needs to own the group membership. They need to be able to add new members to their project, whether they're inside the organization or outside, easily. If they can't do that, they're going to start doing Dropbox or Box or external things. You're going to lose control of stuff, or your SharePoint is just going to become a wild west and be, become unmanageable. So how do we spin all this up? There's a lot involved here. We've got this custom site template. We've got permissions that need to be applied, groups that need to be created, people that need to go into those groups. We need to make that simple and easy as well. So I talked about having a template for the project site, uh, but that's in the SharePoint side. So we need to go and create the Office 365 group. If we're going to use external users, we need to create an EUM group for that. We need to assign ownership and assign permissions and get that all wired together. You don't want that to be a manual process. You really want to automate that process. So how do we make that better? Let's have a form to request a site. I'm spinning up a new project. I'd like to request it. You know, maybe there's an approval that goes around that. Once it's approved, you want to script that whole process. So we've built a PowerShell script to do that that actually creates the, the, the SharePoint site, creates the Office 55 group, creates the EOM group, knits and wires it all together. And we use an Intex form and workflow to drive that process. Do you have to use an Intex? No. I mean, you could use the out-of-the-box SharePoint lists and list forms to have your request form. You could use an out-of-the-box approval form um, workflow to do the approval on that. You know, it's, it's totally up to you in terms of how you build that out. The important part is to have a structure and a process around that. So let's start with what we have from a request form perspective. So we come back to the top level of our site here. So we've got our list of our clients and our projects. Let's say we want to add a new project in there. So we actually have a link right here saying request a new client or project site. So click on that. And it actually opens up the Nintex form. It's very easy for a business owner to, to bang in their information and say, okay, you know, this is the name of my project. I'd like to use this URL. This is the, the PM who's going to be running it. And this is an existing client that I want to associate it with. Or, you know what, I don't have a client. I need to actually create the client site at the same time. Go ahead and save that. And it creates an entry in the list. If we come back to that list itself. I'm not going to go through the actual live setup of the site, but I want to kind of walk you through the process. Basically what we've got, it's a pending projects list in SharePoint that has those requests in them. We can see whether they're approved or not, what status they, they're in, what are the links and such that have gotten set up through that. So I can then have a, a, a workflow associated with that. So I can come into my Nintex workflow here. So we're using Nintex for Office 365, both for the forms and the workflow. Very easy to add that app into your, your tenant when you go from there. And let's look at the project workflow too. So the thing I like about Nintex is it's it's very sort of business user, power user friendly. You know, it's it's very visual design surface that I work with. Okay, I've I've started a new um, 
project site request, I'm going to assign a task to somebody for that to approve that. So I'm actually going to assign that to the approvers group, and they're either going to approve or reject that request. They may find that you know somebody else already requested and we approved a project site for that project. You're just not aware of that. I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to send you the, the rejection email explaining that there's already a site existing for that. Assuming that it's approved, though, I'm going to send the approval email confirming that that's been done, but I need to do a couple of other things as well. I need to go into the project and the client lists and actually set up the, the, the links and references for the, the client and the project that's being created. And I also need to run the PowerShell script to actually provision that whole site structure. We actually haven't wired that piece into Nintex yet in the POC, but that would go right here where you have an action to call it to that PowerShell script. And it basically creates the 365 group, the SharePoint site, um, all the other groups, wires it all together from a permissionist point of view, makes the person that requested it an owner of that, and hands over the keys from there. So they can then just start working with their project site and away they go from there. So that works very well from that perspective. I didn't show you the details of the, the forms designer, but again, nice easy design surface to create that. But again, you don't have to use an index, you could use out of the box from that perspective. And this goes over the, uh, the workflow approval side of it. We're starting to run up on the end of time here. I want to take a couple minutes and talk about external users as well. So if, if we're thinking about people outside your organization that you're going to collaborate with on the project, what would those people look like? You know, are they members? Are you a, a not-for-profit or a charitable organization? Are they your customers or vendors or suppliers? You know, is it board of directors site that you're running projects around? Maybe you're a government organization and there's citizens or education with researchers. I mean, there's a lot of different scenarios for that. And some of the things that we need to think about as we're bringing external users in is who those people are. You know, which of those categories? Are we doing just one of them? Do we have multiple different audiences that we're bringing in? And do those different audiences all see the same information or they come into specific things? I mean, in our project sites example, obviously you would belong to, to one or more project sites. We wouldn't see the other project sites through there. Is there some sort of member database that we want to interface in with? You know, you're running dynamic CRM online, say, and you want to track those external interactions as part of your CRM database. How do people come in? Do you invite them? Or can they actually come and self-discover the site and self-register and request access? If they do that, who approves those new registrations? What does that workflow look like? And is it just the Office 55 sites that they're going to be coming into? Or is there other systems from a single sign-on perspective that we need to think about? So a couple of things to think about from an authentication point of view. There's a, a number of different options on both internal staff and external people how they could authenticate into Office 65. The first and the easiest is a cloud identity. So you've got an account in Azure Active Directory. There's no integration there. You've got a username and password. In you come and away you go. That's sort of the out-of-the-box original when you create your tenant in 365. Most organizations set up some sort of uh, DirSync, whether they're syncing just the profile information or they may actually uh, sync the usernames and passwords of their internal users up into the cloud. So those people can sign on with the same password. It's not single sign-on, but at least it's a, a single identity that they need to remember through there. Larger organizations typically they'll do a, what's called a federated identity, where they actually federate their on-premises Active Directory. So when those people come in, they're actually signing in through their on-premise Active Directory. And that does give you a true single sign-on. That's what we do at Envision IT here. But let's think about the external users. So that was for internal. What can we do from that point of view? Well, we could just create full subscription accounts, pay the $6.10 Canadian a month if you're here in Canada for, say, an E1 license for Office 65. Certainly you can do that, uh, maybe not the most cost-effective if you've got a large number of external users. You can use Office 65 external sharing, and I'll talk about that in a second, or you can use our extranet user manager product. So from an external sharing point of view, actually, I keep forgetting to update this slide. It's no longer 10,000 free external users. It literally is unlimited. You can invite as many. You can pay that $6.10 for a one-user subscription to Office 65 and invite a million people in, and that's well within the, the boundaries of the, the licensing. Key is that those million people all have to be external to your organization. You can't cheat Microsoft and say, well, I'm going to give my staff external access. That doesn't fly from a terms of use point of view. The other caveat is they have to use a Microsoft account in order to come in, either like a Hotmail or, or um, Outlook.com type account, or they, they are actually an Office 65 subscriber themselves. You don't have any control over who that account is. Um, it's actually the person that gets the invitation that decides what account is going to come in. It's really a lightweight solution. So it's not great from a governance point of view, but it's free and it works well from that point of view. 
Um, our product kind of builds on top of that to say, well, let's have a fully branded experience. Here's a, a, an example for Kinross, global uh, mining company, the 7,000 suppliers around the world that need to come in and work with them. They've got a bunch of workflows and forms and approval process that they need to go through. There's actually isn't in Office 365, it's in Azure, same concept though. I mean, we fully federate with Office 365, allow you to have this branded experience and come in as part of that. Um, you can you can determine whether they self-register or whether they, they are invitation only, and away you go from there. There's still some licensing issues we're working through. Actually, there's some interesting new news around Azure B2B that we're looking to leverage. I'm actually out in Redmond for the MVP summit next week. So looking to connect with some of those Redmond folks and understand more about how we can work with that um, and make sure that there's not an issue from a licensing point of view bringing those external users in, which is really the spirit of what Microsoft's looking to do, just working through a few last technical details there. So if we come back to the browser here for a second and I bring up, uh, sorry, one more site here. So if I go, say, to ocast.sharepoint.com, so one thing to note is anytime you're working in 365, you're going to have a, a .sharepoint.com URL for your SharePoint site. That's just the reality. It doesn't matter who you are. What we've done is set up an auto redirect on that to our login form. So you no longer see the Microsoft login form. You see the branded form, in this case, for the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Society. Um, they can basically register to create an account. It goes through an approval process. You know, and this whole process is fairly customized for them. And then they can log in with their email and password into Office 365. If they're staff, they can bypass that and log straight in through there. So it provides a very nice experience to take those project sites and expose them out to um, folks outside of your organization as well. So I think we're at the uh, T minus two minutes mark. I should probably circle back to any last questions we want to address here, and then we'll wrap it up from there. So Mark, any, uh, any other questions of interest that we should dive into from there? Or you've been doing an awesome job of answering them as you've been going? Good to hear. Okay, uh, last slide. If you're curious more around the Extranet User Manager or rolling out the, the project site templates, you'd like to work with us from that point of view, by all means, reach out to Erica Mall on the sales side. Uh, her contact information is up in here. She can set up a, a deeper one-on-one -on -one demo, either of the Extranet User Manager or diving specifically into the, the project sites themselves. So from there, I want to make sure I'm, I'm mindful of your time. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we'll uh, wrap it up from there. Have a great rest of your day.